Let me introduce our speaker today. Our speaker today is Gary uh, Bentrup. He is a research landscape planner for the U.S. Forest Service with the USDA National Agroforestry Center in Lincoln, Nebraska. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Gary. Thank you, Bob. And welcome to the webinar today. And as Bob mentioned, I'm with the USDA National Agroforestry Center, which is often referred to as NAC. NAC is located in Lincoln, Nebraska, and is a collaborative partnership between US Forest Service Research, state and private forestry, and the Natural Resource Conservation Service. NAC's mission is to advance the science and technology transfer of agroforestry. And my work particularly focuses on developing science-based tools and resources for practitioners. As natural resource planners and foresters, we have many tools and resources at our disposal for doing our job. Today, I'd like to introduce you one tool that we have developed at NAC, Evidence-Based Guidelines for Designing Conservation Buffers. My presentation will set the stage for this tool, what it is, and why it is developed but most importantly, I will show you how to use it for resource planning and design. Although this is only an hour-long webinar, I have set some basic objectives and outcomes for what I hope we can accomplish during our time together. First is just to provide awareness of evidence-based guidelines for buffers and develop a basic comfort level in using these guidelines as a design aid. But maybe most importantly, building interest in designing for multiple functions where appropriate. So with that roadmap, let's begin. First, what is a buffer? Areas or strips of land maintained in permanent vegetation to provide ecological, economic, or social benefits. It should be noted that this definition does not have a specific um, land use or landscape context that is implied. For instance, I'm referring to buffers in both upland and riparian settings. Often when we hear the term buffer, we automatically assume riparian forest buffers. But that's not the case here. I'm also encompassing a broad range of land uses from wildland, rural, and urban settings. So, our kind of first chat question is, what are some of the other similar terms do we use in addition to the word buffer? And you can kind of type in your response in the chat window and see what people across the country uh, have been using for this term. Looks like we're seeing some, a nice range of corridors and streamside management zones, filter strips, visual screens. That's a real uh, nice cross-section. The terminology, when you look in the, the literature, really is pretty broad. We have common terms such as buffer corridors and greenways, as well as filter strips. Some of the more unusual terms are uh, living fences and even a term called beetle banks. Often these terms are associated with a specific resource issue or function. For instance, when we hear the term buffer, we often think about water quality or corridor uh, wildlife movement or greenway aesthetics and maybe recreation. In today's webinar, I will be using the term buffer generically to capture all these types of terms as well as the potential functions they can provide. Buffers can potentially provide many benefits to landowners and society by modifying landscape functions. This slide presents a simple typology of functions that buffers could provide. Obvious one be a habitat. That one really doesn't need much explanation. Source, this could be a source of marketable products for a landowner, uh, non-timber forest specialty products, or a source of plant propagules. A sink could be a sink for uh, pollutants or maybe carbon. Filter, again, filtering maybe, say, phosphorus, or a conduit for wildlife or even pedestrians. And then you have the uh, barrier function. 
So another chat question is, how many of you have planned or designed or implemented a buffer type of project? And that one can be probably answered best with the raise your hand option. Uh, and then the uh, follow-up question you can answer in the chat window is, what type of functions did you design for? And you don't need to use the term source, sync, or filter. You can simply state functions such as erosion control, odor mitigation, uh, maintain stream temperatures, or manage drifting snow. Just to get kind of an idea of what people have been designing for. I'll give you a few moments to do that. Looks like a nice range of, of functions people have been uh, designing for. Erosion, water quality, visual screens, water qu quality again, visual. Um, thermal regulation or maintaining stream temperatures, aesthetics. So that's great to see the range of functions people have been uh, planning and designing these for. So these functions we just kind of listed and talked about, and the level in which they can be obtained is primarily determined by the buffer's location and the structural characteristics of the buffer. So for instance, with landscape setting, whether it is in an upland setting or a riparian setting, or also the adjacent land uses will dictate the type of functions and the level in which we can attain them. Site location, obviously soils, slope, aspect are some of the considerations under uh, this factor. The configuration, this is getting at shape, orientation to flows such as wind or uh, pollutant runoff or snow. Horizontal structure is getting at the density of plant materials. And the vertical structure is then looking at that vertical component, whether it's a single story, say grass only type of a buffer, or if it's a mixed vegetation, mixed story. And then the plant community, getting at the specific um, types of species that will uh, play a role in determining the functions that can be obtained. So, there's many places we can go to get sources of information for planning and design buffers. We have our personal experience, uh, colleagues and experts. We have both gray and scientific literature. And all these play an important role in helping us uh, answer our questions and providing design information. So I was curious, where do you go for information on designing and managing buffers. And again, you could just type a response in the chat window just to see what people consult. So we see BMP manuals are a great resource. NRCS, Google Scholar for probably uh, technical advice and jurisdictional guidelines. Often there will be regulations and ordinances that might uh, dictate what uh, we have to design for. So we can see a nice, nice cross section of resources, and these are all very valuable. All right. So I'd like to focus our kind of discussion today on evidence based information, which simply is information that has some quality control checks typically research and scientific studies. And this includes case studies, experimental results, field surveys, modeling results. I do want to emphasize that when I, I say we're focusing on evidence-based information, this is not to imply this is the only information one should consider and use. However, it is the type of information that is often not necessarily used the most effectively and efficiently. For example, a survey of wetland managers found that only 2% of the managers used primary scientific literature 
in developing their wetland management plans. The majority relied on anecdotal sources, personal experience, or speaking with others. Well, the fact that evidence-based information is not used as often as it should be is really not too surprising given the challenges associated with this type of information. First, it's often buried in journal articles and books that are really not that accessible. A wide range of journals may be available to scientists, but not to field practitioners. Even if the research articles are accessible, they may not be easily understood and may not be even relevant to the practitioner's world. Practitioners really need information on the specific variables they can manipulate and control. Furthermore, scientific information is rarely synthesized to a current state of the knowledge. You know, the scientific process is based on studying individual components. And until those components are kind of synthesized into a more meaningful whole, it can be difficult to really have a sense of what the science is saying. So with that in mind, we decided to take a look at the scientific literature and distill it into evidence-based guidelines for design and management of buffers. We synthesized and distilled research results from over 1,400 research publications. And the result is a field guide called Conservation Buffers, Design Guidelines for Buffers, Corridors, and Greenways. In this guide, there are over 80 design guides that are applicable nationwide in wildland, rural, and urban settings for a variety of resource issues. The guidelines are primarily targeted for resource professionals. That's the kind of the audience we were shooting for. It is important to note that this guide is not meant to replace existing design resources or BMP manuals or other resources, but only provide access to evidence-based information that may often not be easily accessible or understandable. So the resources covered in this guide are some of the common ones one would think of, improve air and water quality, protect soil, enhance habitat. But some of the more unusual ones include enhance economic productivity, or provide recreation opportunities, or beautify the landscape, or uh, deal with some of the aesthetic qualities in regards to odor or noise control. Um, and that's kind of one of the things that we hope makes this guide a little bit more unique, is covering the broad range of, of resource issues. So here's a page from uh, the water quality section. Uh, the guidelines are uh, very well illustrated. And the focus was on simple terminology. So a person that may be trained in hydrology could understand the sections in More of the Wildlife. It wasn't written to in a certain um, scientific ease, uh, so that it could really uh, be able to be read and understood by a wide range of resource professionals. And the focus was to really uh, deal with the structure and location variables that we mentioned earlier that will dictate the level, the type of functions that can be obtained and the level in which they can be obtained. Here's just another sec uh, example. This one is on a noise control. Uh, we try to seek out quantitative information from the research literature in order to provide specific guidance uh, as much as possible. Sometimes the availability of quantitative information varied with resource issues. Uh, some issues have greater research foundation and more information to glean from. Uh, no surprise, biodiversity and water quality were some of the areas that we had quite the research foundation upon which to build guidelines from. But even in the other sections, when one cast a broad net through the research literature, we could often find enough adequate uh, information to at least based some guidelines on to provide uh, a direction. And uh, so that was interesting to know. Do want to mention that the uh, guidelines also try to look at the negative effects that buffers could uh, create 
this isn't to be a, a promo book promoting all the wonderful things that buffers can do. It's also to recognize some of the potential negative impacts they can create. Um, and you know, this includes uh, things such as edge effects. And I'll touch upon that in a, a little later. But that's uh, also covered in the guide. So moving now kind of more into using the guide, the, here's a table of contents. The guide, I think, uh, you were had the ability to download the PDF version of the guide today. Uh, the guide can also be requested uh, free from the National Agroforestry Center. And it's a spiral bound guide, uh, kind of uh, fits into a, a field vest. And uh, has a table of contents with the tabs to facilitate moving to the sections uh, quickly. Now, within the guide, we synthesize the functions, uh, the information on the functions, into 35 different functions that buffers have been documented to provide uh, in the different kind of categories, such as water quality, biodiversity, uh, uh, protective soils, and so forth. Um, use the pointer here. So here's like the buffer functions listed on this side under the different kind of issues and objectives. Uh, so we see stabilized soil, improved soil quality. If we look over in aesthetics and visual quality, we have enhanced visual interest or screen undesirable views or screen undesirable noise in regards to outdoor recreation. We have functions as increase natural area, uh, protect natural areas. Uh, and then even under the economic one, which people don't often necessarily think of buffers in regard, but they could be a source of marketable products. They could reduce uh, energy consumption, such as a windbreak around a, a home or a community. They've been documented to show increased property values uh, in certain locations. So this gives a range of the functions that uh, are covered in this guide. So let's take a little closer look. Uh, for now, we'll look at protection and safety and drill in a little closer and take a, a little bit closer look at it. If we go to the section on protection and safety, we'll find a, a front section that will list the objectives. Um, that will list the objectives of what uh, can be accomplished with buffers under the category protection and safety, such as protect from wind or snow, increase biological pest control. And then underneath are the buffer functions, the specific kind of landscape or ecosystem services that buffers can modify uh, to achieve these type of functions. And these functions are listed at the top of this table here. And then the guidelines have a name and a number and are listed right along the side here. We'll go to the next slide to see how this uh, looks in a little closer detail. So again, we have the guidelines listed along the left-hand side, such as windbreaks for livestock or managing drifting snow or managing shade and then the functions that they can provide. And so the check marks indicate which guidelines will address these specific functions. So let's take a look at enhanced habitat for predators of pests. We can see that four uh, functions are, or four guidelines are listed that will address that particular function. We can then take a look at a specific guideline, in this case, buffers and spray drift, and look and see what it has to say in regards to uh, enhancing habitat for predators of pests. So if we go to that section, we have guidelines reg regarding buffers and spray drift. And this can be both in a, what one might think in a crop setting, but also in uh, aero application in forest for uh, beetle control or 
uh, orchards where there may be spraying in that regard. So the guideline often has key considerations. These are getting at the structural and location uh, variables that uh, you as a planner and designer can manage for. Things such as plant height, how high they need to be. This example here shows what the research literature has summarized as far as uh, the minimum buffer widths recommended to protect sensitive non-targets such as uh, vegetation, and that would be, say, seedlings or a crop, or protect an aquatic environment or protect invertebrates. Whether the um, spray mechanism is via a, a tractor or aerial. Again, the wide range of uh, spray drift recommendations are based, obviously, on the range of um, chemicals used out there. And these are only just kind of broad guidelines, and obviously, uh, one would need to consult more with the specific uh, chemical recommendations. But this gives a sense of uh, those guidelines and how uh, one could use them. All right. In addition to the one table that shows the uh, specific guidelines under that section, there are often guidelines in other sections that would be relevant to that previous function. For instance, uh, enhanced habitat for predators of pests. This table shows guidelines within other sections of the book that might be relevant to that function. So it's often valuable to consult this and see what other uh, guidelines one might want to take a look at. In this case, let's just take a quick look at corridor width, since it says that's one to take a look at. Here are uh, looking at corridor width kind of primarily from a biodiversity standpoint. Uh, some simple graphics illustrating some uh, width considerations based on body size or corridor length. Uh, and then again, kind of summary uh, table down here showing what the literature has said to be a minimum uh, recommended width for different guilds of species. And then upwards, kind of what has been some of the more upper width recommendations. Again, just giving kind of a range of what the uh, evidence says are some uh, good considerations. All right. So here's another polling question. How many of you have would like or have a need to access the original scientific literature when you know, planning or designing uh, buffers? And you can just um, probably answer that as a polling question. And this, and this can vary, right? Some person just ch typed in. They don't really need to. And we find that some people do need to, to say maybe they need to create a report that has citations. Others really don't have a need to. So it, it does vary with our audience. And I just want to focus a little bit of our time on showing how one can access the literature if you do need to. Um, as mentioned, the guide has over 1,400 references. And the references can be found at this uh, website where there's an online version of the guide. Now, we did not include the references in the actual field guide or the citations because it would no longer be a field guide. But it would actually um, start to look like a, a large city phone book. Uh, and that would be kind of defeating the purpose. But if you do need to go to the, to the uh, references, it's easy to do on the website. You can go to the specific guidelines, for instance, say, buffers for pathogens. And then down below will be the references that the guideline was based upon. So you can see the literature if you need to uh, cite it or access it for your own uh, need. It should be noted that the references, this guide was published in um, early 2009. So the scientific literature is up to date to 2008. Now, if you want to see if there's some more current literature, or if you want to follow up on that, one could easily just 
copy, cut out this uh, reference, and go into a search engine such as Google Scholar or another scientific search engine, drop in the name of the article, and maybe find the um, a copy of the uh, scientific article. Our original hope was we were going to try to have all of the uh, literature cited actually as links in the web-based version, but due to copyright laws, uh, we weren't able to do that. But this is an opportunity to use the internet to see if you can find an own uh, copy if you do need that. And then down here, uh, to see if there's any more recent literature, one can click on the Cited By and see new references uh, or new publications that cite this reference. So it's a way to be able to find newer uh, literature. So just wanted to point uh, that out. So the tool, we've kind of so far covered that the tool can be used to design um, basically a buffer for a single function. You can use it to find more um, literature or use it as a reference, a resource in that matter. Or um, another thing we have noticed people have been using it for as a communication tool when working with landowners and stakeholders. Uh, the visual nature of the guide has proven to be uh, very handy in um, communicating with uh, landowners. But most importantly, I want to focus on what the original intent of this guide was to do, and that's to design for um, multiple functions. It's often more efficient and effective to design buffers to provide multiple functions than for a single function. You know, whether planned or not, buffers will have an impact on a variety of functions, and thus it's better to take a more comprehensive perspective when planning and designing these features. Now, often it is a balancing act with uh, landowner goals and with larger societal goals. And so there really needs to be some kind of mechanism for kind of trying to determine uh, uh, trade-offs and synergies between functions. And that's what we'll talk a little bit more upon. So, now we're going to move into kind of how to use the guide and want to uh, focus on a little simple matrix tool that will be used to help kind of compare trade-offs between functions. Again, I kind of want to stress up front that the guide won't be your only source of information and one will augment it with information from a variety of sources that we previously discussed, one's own expertise, other BMP manuals, possibly even computer models, et cetera. This slide provides just a basic outline of the process, and we'll use a conceptual case study to illustrate this process, and we'll basically go up to step three. We won't really focus on a design plan today, but we'll show how to kind of use the, the design matrix tool in comparing uh, functions. So our little case study to kind of put a little context for this example is, and the first step is to identify issues and objectives. So we have, a, in this case study, we have two basic issues which are occurring in a riparian landscape setting. So we already have our kind of location determined. First, there's a desire to enhance a cold water fishery. In this uh, case study, data has revealed that the primary limiting factor for the fishery is rising stream temperatures, which are due to lack of shade along the stream. Second, there is a need to minimize property loss due to ongoing stream bank erosion. So we can create a simple little table and now um, place in our desired ob objectives. So the desired objectives for this example are to enhance the fishery by 10% increase in annual production and to reduce stream bank erosion by 25%. While it's not always possible to have measurable objectives, it's often desirable in order to have some kind of measurable in order to evaluate the effectiveness of the project over time. 
of course, we all know the challenges of uh, monitoring a project uh, is, is often not available to us uh, due to either funding or lack of follow-up. But when we can, setting uh, measurable objectives is desirable. So our, uh, whoops, yes, yeah, so going on to the, sorry. Uh, so we have our next chat question. So given that those are our objectives, what type of buffer functions will you you think will help us achieve the desired objectives? And you can type in the chat window for that. And we'll see what uh, people recommend. So we've got a few people jumping in. Shade, runoff control. Right, so a conservation. And there will be a lot of factors that will be, you know, looking at um, the whole kind of watershed as a uh, thing beyond just what a buffer can uh, impact. Because again, sometimes buffers can be viewed as just a band-aid approach to solving problems. And uh, we don't really advocate, obviously, that. Uh, but we're just saying, if you're going to do a buffer and these are your objectives, what are the functions you're going to try to achieve? And so, yeah, primarily we're going to look at trying to shade the stream to maintain temperatures or have uh, thermal regulation control on the stream, and then really look at reducing uh, bank erosion. So if we went through the guide, and, and we won't kind of go through specifically, we would find for these functions, there are these guidelines that would come up. And you can see they're in various sections of the guide. Uh, the ones with the two are in the wildlife. The one in, with starting with ones are in uh, water, three in soil. And so we can see kind of the range of uh, guidelines that we can use to uh, help us design uh, our buffer. All right, moving on into this, what I call the matrix tool, is just a simple spreadsheet. And it's more conceptual in nature than thinking of a specific uh, tight spreadsheet. And it's a way of just collecting our information and thoughts when we're going to look for information to help us design. So here we have the function at the top. Uh, where we said we're going to try to shade the stream to maintain temp temperature, reduce bank erosion. Then over here on this column, we have the design element. These are the de design features that we have control over in order, and that will affect how well we can achieve those functions. So we have landscape setting, the site location, vegetation characteristics, if there are height considerations. Um, it's also worthwhile at the top to sometimes have a summary of effectiveness. And this can be just to document what, how well uh, a buffer could actually accomplish uh, this function. In regards, uh, some functions can be better obtained with a buffer than other functions. Um, so that's a good way to place that uh, information just to kind of keep it uh, in front of one's mind as one's designing a buffer. And then this is kind of part two of that table. And we can see some of the other design elements that we would consider include width, density, uh, length, and other considerations that might not fall under these other type of design elements or design criteria. So if we go back to the guide for now, we can find some sections on uh, stream temperature and buffers. and vegetation for um, bank erosion control, and some recommendations. Uh, and we can then take that information and kind of organize it into our uh, design matrix tool. And this is where we can start to also put in uh, information from other sources. So again, this spreadsheet really is, can expand or contract based on uh, 
where how much information is available. So, you know, for instance, uh, for shading streams, uh, shading streams to maintain temperature, they're more effective on small streams. Uh, the literature has shown, uh, and obviously on a larger stream, one needs to buffer the network of headwater streams feeding into the larger stream. Uh, buffers are more effective in watersheds that have a higher percentage of overall vegetative cover. This just gives an example of pulling in that information into a chart so that we can start to compare and weigh uh, criteria and the individual functions. So here's just showing the um, table being filled in for, other, uh, for the other features. Uh, for instance, here's another consideration under stream temperature, uh, particularly with like stream management uh, zones where there may have been a harvest and buffers are retained after a harvest. They may require wider buffers due to susceptibility to wind throw. Or another consideration is groundwater inflow may affect stream temperature more than uh, a buffer can affect with shade. And those are just uh, other considerations that would be taken into account. As I mentioned, one would also use other information uh, to design a buffer. And for instance, one would consult, uh, say, the USDA plants database for selecting plants that are appropriate in one's uh, region and, and setting. Uh, the soil survey uh, information will also be extremely valuable. Uh, in our example, uh, with uh, shade, uh, there is a calculator by NOAA that can be used to calculate um, shade patterns over the course of year at different latitudes and longitudes uh, dur during the time of year. And there's also uh, computer models available for uh, erosion and control. And so again, the spreadsheet offers you the ability to kind of collect and gather information. And this just kind of illustrates with the um, uh, functions filled out for, uh, whoops, uh, for the uh, two functions. Well, now once we have it kind of completed, and this is just again kind of a conceptual example, we now are going through the task of actually seeing are these functions truly compatible based on the, each of the different design elements. So the process would be to go through each of the design elements and see if they are compatible or if they conflict, and if they conflict, can compromise be made. So let's go through and actually kind of do this for a few examples. So if we take a look at landscape setting, we can look at and we can kind of skim over what the uh, evidence says. And basically, for both functions, buffers will be more effective on smaller streams, uh, particularly with lower discharge and with lower um, peak volumes. Uh, and so if we kind of look at these two functions, they obviously could probably be pretty compatible. Um, and so really, in essence, this particularly uh, design criteria, they basically have similar design criteria and so would be compatible. Now if we go and look at site location and layout, we can kind of look over and, and read the um, different criteria. For instance, under shading stream to maintain temperature, they're more effective near water's edge and along west and stream banks, uh, west and south stream banks. Uh, they, the evidence also shows that shade appears to moderate temperatures more effectively in streams with a higher width to depth ratio. Shading stream effectiveness decreases as stream width increases. Okay. But now as we look at reduced bank erosion, look, it recommends that we really need to locate buffers on both sides of a stream. Stabilizing just one side can obviously accelerate erosion on the other side. Stream banks with higher silt clay content may hinder root density, leading to higher erosion rates. And stream banks with greater than three feet will be more difficult to stabilize. 
But if we kind of analyze and think about these criteria, we probably come to the conclusion the criteria are different, but they are relatively compatible. We could combine them both and um, make it probably work. They're not restricting each other. Um, they may uh, affect the level of performance. You know, if the stream bank uh, width is wider, the shading won't be as effective. But now let's move on to a third example. Here we have some actually more, a little bit more quantitative information. Recommended widths typically range from 30 to 100 feet on both sides of the stream, although research suggests that 100 foot width offers a significantly higher probability of effectiveness. Obviously, the final width should respond to landscape and site conditions. Now, the research literature in regards to bank erosion suggests that the bank width should increase as the banks become higher and less stable. And that additional width should be allowed uh, somewhat as a sacrifice zone while the vegetation matures uh, to a point of being effective. Uh, initially, when the roots are small and or when the plants are young and the roots are less developed, uh, there still will be probably significant stream bank erosion. So now we have kind of an interesting question to contemplate. What criteria do you go with when one has a higher uh, kind of right, higher requirement, if uh, there's a qualitative or quantitative requirement? And so you can um, type in your response in the chat one. I'll give you a few moments for that. Since the one, um, we're seeing a few people now answer. Most are going with the most stringent or higher quantitative requirement. Uh, exactly. So, and that's where, in this case, we, we don't have any specific quantitative information on the reduced bank erosion. But generally, it's been a lot. Uh, less than the 30 to 100 feet recommendations that the stream temperature one has. So in order to accomplish both functions, we would go with the one that has the stricter design criteria. And in this case, shading streams to maintain temperature would be the higher uh, criteria. And so we would just recommend doing um, the, the 30 to 100 foot recommendation and then that way, one will also accomplish the bank erosion criteria as well. All right, moving on into a fourth example, we'll take a look at height. Here we have under uh, shading streams to maintain temperature. Obviously, taller vegetation consisting of large trees will provide more shade. There is evidence saying that unmowed or ungrassed tall grass buffers may provide adequate shade on streams less than eight feet wide. Um, but for the most part, one will probably need to be using uh, shrubs and trees in order to provide more adequate uh, shade on the water surface. Now, if we look at reduced bank erosion, on high deep banks, large trees may increase mass failure by adding weight to the bank and creating toppling leverage. And dense shading from tall species may suppress understory growth, leading to unprotected areas that could be susceptible to surface erosion or also maybe stream bank erosion. So here we have kind of a bit of a conundrum. They seem to be more in uh, conflict. And this is where it becomes the designer's expertise to make a judgment call and decide can one accomplish both of these uh, criteria or can they be modified uh, and make a suitable uh, compromise where both functions still could maybe be obtained. And this is subjective, but it's suggested that one could probably do a compromise in this uh, case taller vegetation, 
consisting of trees will provide more shade, but probably the trees should be evaded, avoided in some of the most vulnerable areas to mass failure. And then selecting and maintaining appropriate overstory species that will not suppress understory growth will also be kind of an important uh, factor. And so it gets into a little bit of the management uh, case to do this. So again, it's a kind of a subjective call as one's going through weighing these um, criteria to determine if a function, if these functions can be accomplished in the same location at the same time. Well, is there going to be a case where there's incompatible functions? And yes, there will be times when uh, buffer functions won't be uh, compatible. And you'll find criteria just that are too much in conflict. And one will probably need to do a buffer in two different locations or do something entirely different. May, um, maybe not a buffer type of best management practice, but something entirely different in order to accomplish the two functions. And I just want to use one little example here to illustrate that point. And this one's a water quality example. And we have, say, nitrogen uh, laden runoff and phosphorus. Well, with nitrogen, uh, actually we're trying to remove nitrogen with a riparian uh, buffer in a setting will be effective because the moist soils found in the riparian setting are very important to denitrification and removing NO2 uh, into the air. And so there is a way of uh, removing nitrogen efficiently through a riparian buffer. In contrast, a phosphorus, if phosphorus is stored in a um, riparian buffer, it will be uptake by uh, the plant materials or stored in the soil. Um, but that may be a very ephemeral or temporary uh, storage. There is no removal like denitrification for phosphorus. So if a flood comes along and mobilizes uh, the soil or the detritus, you will get phosphorus uh, moving through the aquatic um, chain and leading to some of the problems uh, of eutrophication and so forth. So the recommendation would be to use an upland buffer for uh, phosphorus removal. So in this case, really the two kind of locations or criteria dictate that these won't be accomplished most efficiently in one location and instead need to do it in two different locations. So with that, I think we are about five minutes out from the end of the webinar and like to open it up to any uh, questions. And again, we'd like to note that the guide can be requested from um, NAC. And uh, we do have uh, it if you have any need for it in another language. Uh, we do have it available in other languages, including Spanish. We have one question, are there firewise or fire control concepts included? And uh, yes, uh, there are. Uh, we did summarize the research literature on that one. That I off the top of my head, I think is in the protection and safety section. Uh, so uh, there is some on the firewise, and there is some kind of quantitative information on that. And yes, we can get you a copy of the PowerPoint presentation. And somebody has a question regarding tree species of best near streams. And that one, since this guide was kind of a nationwide guide, uh, it's really kind of a um, eco-region based question and that's where I would suggest consulting like the plants database uh, as a resource or a local plant uh, specialist uh, to say what would be best in one's area for streams. A coworker of mine is working on a plant database uh, for riparian species uh, and so hopefully we'll have that tool available at some point. Any other questions? Uh, 
Uh, why should I vegetation on west and south uh, side of the stream banks? Uh, the evidence has shown that uh, the solar aspect of those are going to uh, have the most impact on the uh, thermal heat gain of a stream. It's not to say that there won't be some benefit on other sides, and in fact, one would probably want to make sure you're planting on the other sides as well. Uh, is there a section on cost considerations? Uh, not really. That uh, we do not have in this uh, guide. Um, but that's a good point. Yes, there is some guidelines regarding biomass for energy. We do have that in there. Uh, and kind of comparing uh, biomass for energy and looking at kind of different um, plant materials in that regard, like switchgrass, popular cotton, uh, kind of wood, and uh, looking at, there's a table with kind of comparing those. So there is that in there. All right, Gary, thank you. A um, couple notes, folks. If you're looking for a copy of today's presentation, you can either go back to forestrywebinars.net and you can download it from the site. Or if you go up to Windows uh, on Collaborate and click on Show File Transfer Library, you can click on presentation.pdf and it will prompt you to download it again. You were prompted when you joined the session. So, And the guide is also available um, under Windows Show File Transfer Library and you can download that file also. I do like to thank Gary for all his time and energy in putting this webinar together. We did run into a snafu last time we tried to do this with uh, some technical difficulty and I'm uh, very excited that this uh, worked out this time. It's been a fascinating subject and a tool that should be able to be used by almost anybody that uh, is working on buffers. It's been a, a very interesting talk related to this tool. A reminder, if you can complete the uh, short quiz and survey at the end of the uh, today's webinar, that would be very helpful. I've posted the URL already in the chat window and now I'm going to push it out to um, everybody uh, through Collaborate. This should open the browser for you. Uh, realize that there's about 80 of us on the session so it may take a, a little bit for it to load on your computer. And that should pop up right behind or in front of your Collaborate session. And it may take a, a little bit of time because it's trying to push out to 80 some people. So with that, let's give a round of applause to uh, Gary for all that he's done to put this presentation together.